Well, first of all, let me <coughs> uh, let me welcome you. All, let me welcome all of you uh, who participated in this participated in this uh, live little conference here, especially those of you who traveled from afar. North America and Central America, Valeria Rosa, thank you for coming. That's really nice, that kind of effort. Um, and it's no need probably to, to present ourselves in a way because our names are written on the uh, everywhere. On. <laughs> <coughs> I just want to, to give a little uh, little introduction here. Um, first of all, this is more third conference uh, in a row of conferences. We did two already, especially together with uh, Colleagues from Hamburg, uh, Berlin, uh, and and Tübingen, uh, and so far we looked at self-propelled processes in uh, Central Europe, but also uh, very much in China, uh, Japan, uh, and Korea. So we did some testing on on, on foreign lands <clears throat> when it comes comes to the concept uh, of um, of our um, of our conference here. The theme of the conference um, is change, but a special, uh, but we gave change a special spinning, so to speak. Change as change, because that would be a bit annoying, change is everywhere, and almost, so to speak. So uh, we certainly need to specify in a way, and we try to specify uh, in, in two ways. <clears throat> the first step would be to specify, um, to theorize about um, how change could uh, could come along or come about, and second is uh, to adapt uh, the theoretical part of the change to pre-modern societies because we we think that pre-modern societies are a little bit different from uh, modern societies if we are not. Mm -hmm. So the basic idea of this approach, and I have to read the definition out, is that processes drive change out of themselves without, however, affecting the underlying structures of society. To give a definition, momentum of its own or self-propelled processes, eigendynamic in Deutsch, can be described as inherent dynamics if they continue to move out of themselves and without further external influence, thereby producing and reproducing a pattern characteristic of them. So there's a self-propelled process that means driving force built in these processes and producing effects that are almost like the processes themselves. Uh, of course, momentum of its own also rests on the action of actors. However, momentum processes are able to motivate individuals to participate and sustain in these very processes. So the actor is very relevant, of course. We do not roll him out of these processes, but he is kind of motivated in taking part in these processes. <clears throat> so, um, to emphasize this very demanding concept, <clears throat> we singled out three prominent societies that presumably um, can be character um, can be um, um, defined as a basis, basic elements of any pre-modern societies. Not only European ones, not only Chinese. You don't only find them in China. Um, you may have found them in India and in Japan. We tested that a little bit already. I'm not sure whether and to what dimension we will find them in Latin America, and that's what these, this conference here is. So what would these three features be like? <clears throat> we identified a state-based hierarchical order and group participation, that will be one, a culture of presence, that will be two, and consensus orientation, that is three. Uh, now all these three features, state-based hierarchical order and group orientation, culture of presence and consensus orientation, these three features usually and don't run the risk to be characterized as specific dynamic features to the contrary. Usually, uh, these features, uh, as, as the saying goes, are like petrifying pre-modern societies in the first place. Now, a closer look, uh, we presume, <coughs> proves the opposite. So, 
For instance, if you look at the state-based hierarchical order of the group orientation, yes, the concept as such stays the same for a very long period of time. That's part of the definition mentioned above. So the driving force, like the state-based hierarchical society, uh, stays for in Europe, but also in China and, and Japan, as I mentioned. But, and this is a big but, down to earth, uh, the position of a given nobleman, of a given peasant, of a given duke, is always a matter of debate. Or to pin it down to very concrete uh, situations, if you attend as a duke um, an imperial diet or any, or any other kind of, or if you attend as a merchant, uh, if you join as a merchant um, uh, a procession in your town, the question is, at a certain degree, open which position you will hold in this given procession. Last year, it might be number three. This year, somebody considers you, you better stay behind him in number four or five. A lot of research is done in that respect, that these positions as such are always a matter of debate and a matter of quarrel and, uh, and controversy, especially people from Münster know how to sing the song <laughs> very intensely. Um, so, <clears throat> so here, um, again, the difference between uh, the concept of, a, of an hierarchical order that is con conceptualized as static, and almost everybody subscribes to that hierarchical order, and the question, where do I put myself, which possession do I hold, uh, precisely this, this tension precisely f uh, ends up in a dynamism, which is yeah, a self-propelled dialogue is an eigendynamic because, as I said, uh, the concept stays there. The, uh, the orientation of the actors toward this concept is always there, but the position as such is always as a matter of debate. What is more, to stick to, um, to the hierarchical order, what is more is it's not only the position that is a, um, a matter of debate, but these pre-modern societies, if I may put it uh, that way, these pre-modern societies are in a way very creative. It's not only the, uh, that every position is in dispute, but also the way it is disputed changes from time to time. For instance, if I may stick with Europe as an example, because I'm not an expert uh, uh, in areas outside Europe, uh, the coat of arms <coughs> was invented during the high and late Middle Ages. In the early Middle Ages, you don't find the coat of arms as a measure to delimitate estates. These that are written down and told about families uh, about dynasties, <clears throat> you find most of the time in the late, invented during the late Middle Ages, and foster the position of a given noble family <clears throat> within the realm, uh, within the, the context of other families. You find those stories, you don't find those stories in pre-modern time, uh, in, in early medieval times. And the same is true, for instance, for uh, chronicles about bishoprics and uh, uh, Abbots and so forth and so forth. So the idea is it's not only a reproduction of, or it's not only a constant find of positioning yourself or your group or you name it in a society, it's also a matter of creativity <clears throat> um, to invent new forms of positioning, new forms of uh, um, um, taking place um, in a seating order, uh, so to speak. Just the words on present culture and, and conscience orientation, uh, culture of presence, a gathering as such has a certain dynamic uh, in it. I think that's even true today because you do not know what, how a certain evening will end up, uh, de de depending on what you drink, obviously. So um, the present culture as such, it gives a certain to, uh, to um, self propelled processes because uh, every imperial diet, to stick to that example, is a new gathering. And a new gathering, yes, people remember what happened uh, um, the last imperial diet, who said where, said where, but still it's it's an open situation, so to speak. And despite all these societies have a strong emphasis on writing and even on printing press, um, it is gatherings and the come-togethers are the most important features of that society, in contrast to maybe modern state organizations, which are, which have another uh, form of organization. Consensus orientation does not mean that everybody loves each other, which is not true in pre-modern times, and sad enough, not even in modern times. Um, 
but it means that there is less tolerance or hardly any tolerance in uh, descending positions. So if you have a society where uh, descending positions are either kicked out of the, the city, which is true of Italian city-states, Dante would be an example, um, <clears throat> and then the way to negotiate uh, about certain uh, the, the way how to how disputes are performed obviously different uh, from the uh, if the perspective of the overall perspective is in my opinion let's agree let's get along somehow <clears throat> we suggest uh, what would characterize more or less pre-modern societies, societies uh, lead to self-propelled processes and distinguish self-propelled processes of pre-modern times from self-propelled processes of modern times. Question is then, of course, uh, why should that matter? Um, <clears throat> uh, the question how chain, change comes about and whether we can link our society directly, we find roots of our society directly in pre-modern society, uh, is always, has always been a matter of debate. And usually, as the saying goes, at least parts of historical research uh, tell story like certain regions of society have a certain long history of coming to modernity. That holds true for Europe, of course, Eurocentric teleological narratives. We all know that was for a long time, I think now not that prominent, for a long time, uh, the narrative as such. But we find that in Japan, we find that in China, and I don't know about the uh, about Latin America, but a lot of regions. I mean, if you if you discuss with Ravenna Mudri, he will probably tell you the story of, of India having a special past for thousands of years uh, and have a special civilization distinct from others. Change is a central feature of society. <clears throat> if change in Europe, China, India, and maybe Latin America resemble each other. If these changes in pre-modern societies over a century resemble each other, drivers of change in momentum of its own, the outcome, of course, is different. There's no way, I mean, there's no question that China and Japan are different from, from Europe and China is different from Japan and Japan is different from Latin America. But if the driving, the basic driving forces of change are similar, then these so stories of exceptionalism of, of certain forms of Orientalism all over the place, if you wish, are difficult to tell. So there is something more to that than just um, identifying modes of change in pre-modern times and then go for a beer. If we can prove it, we um, there is you know, some side effects that affect day-to-day, -day, uh, up-to-date politics, I would say. Mm -hmm. My problem here is that I have no idea about Latin American history. So I'm very glad that <clears throat> in our discussions and in preparing this conference, um, Eleonora helped us out and I learned a lot during our discussions and maybe now you could take over if you, if you were kind. Welcome also from my side to everybody. Um, bienvenidos, bienvenidas. Um, es un gusto um, tenerles aquí desde lejos. Um, and um, yeah, so maybe just kind of connecting to your last sentence um, and, and talking a little bit about how this uh, cooperation came about. So this is actually really, really nice. I'm very happy to kind of connect uh, the Center for Inter-American Studies, which is kind of the roof organization, if you will. This is a, an interdisciplinary uh, cooperation between um, the history department and the faculty of um, literature and linguistics here in Bielefeld. Um, so this is one part of the cooperation. And so my, my part in that is I'm, I'm the kind of colonial history uh, professorship in the Latin American history um, working group, as we call it here in Bielefeld. We are, like, are we allowed to call it departments now because we have a department structure? Um, whatever but whatever. yeah so, so <laughs> like <laughs> group group, group. <laughs> so yeah um and so there there is my my colleague um who uh, is is responsible for modern um latin american history olaf kaltmeier who is cannot be here tonight but who would have loved to be here and says hello from afar 
Um, so this is the Center for Inter-American Studies. And um, if you have looked at the poster, I'm not sure the logos are not on your programs. There is also um, the, the Kalas, which is the other center <laughs> that Bielefeld University has with um, the University of Guadalajara. Mm -hmm. It's an institute for advanced study in Latin American studies um, and has been running like since 2017, I think, by now. Um, yeah, and is a, is a long-term, large-scale corporation. And so both of these centers are involved and interested and welcome you here as well in, um, in this conference and also the presentation of, of tonight and are very happy to link themselves um, to the history department. Um, so, yeah, maybe I'm going to um, speak a little bit from a personal perspective of how how I like we came up with this um, uh, tripartite um, organization structure and and my, my own place in this in this project that um, Franz was mentioning that is very globally um, oriented in in its um, aim to kind of find parallels or patterns of um, historical change by way of using this concept of momentum of its own. So I was part of that um, research group for, for a while and um, it was extremely interesting and I learned so much, but I also always felt a little bit as a disturbance factor with environmental history um, as my, my personal focus, um, which um, kind of is an, an external factor to eigendynamic or um, momentum of its own. So, and I'll, I'll be talking about this tomorrow, but so <laughs> that was, that was, we always had very kind of, I felt we had animated and uh, controversial discussions. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm happy to be back and um, to be able to uh, kind of continue this uh, conversation, these perspectives. Um, <clears throat> Also, I mean, what you already kind of teased a little bit um, and mentioned is the fact that the, this concept is, in a way, emerged from a Western or European perspective, but we really want to um, turn it into a, a kind of Eurocentrism or Western critical tool in a, in a certain sense by way of, of taking it to different places and really looking for, for um, yeah, patterns or similarities. Um, so trying to switch this around a little bit from its original place um, of, of origin. Um, and then we also obviously realize that it is not easy or smooth all the time to speak of uh, or speak in European historical terms, um, epochs in the Americas. So pre-modern, modern, early modern or medieval it does not really kind of fit always too well for um, the, the both Americas um, in many ways. So um, we are very happy to have the indigenous expertise here, which goes sort of before uh, European contact and um, colonial history and then also kind of um, complicates all of that as well. So um, this is the other kind of, I think, um, perspective where you have difficulty or interesting <laughs> elements that we are taking up with this, with this conference. Um, yeah, I think that's all I've got to say so far. And I would like to pass on to Andrea.